Good evening. I'm Tom Green. I'm uh, glad that you're joining us here for the second week of this class called Before I Go. Last week, we looked at John chapter 12, and there we saw three encounters with Jesus that showed us a lot about who Jesus is and how people respond to him then and now. But now, for the next three weeks, we're going to narrow the lens in a little bit to his closest followers. It's not going to be crowds of people. This time, it's just going to be a small group of 12 disciples. It's not a series of different people and places and events, but it's going to be a meal and a conversation in a room. And it's not over a couple of days, but rather it's more like a couple of hours for chapters 13 and 14 here in John. And instead of focusing on who Jesus is and how he responds this week in chapter 13, what we're seeing is what Jesus is doing and what he wants us doing. In fact, those are the two truths that I want you to hang on to. Keep in mind as we go through this study tonight. First, Jesus knew exactly what he was doing. And he knows exactly what he's doing. And two, Jesus knows exactly what he wants us doing. You know, the scene in John 13 kind of reminds me a little bit of my youngest daughter and her cross-country experience in high school. This group of kids had run together for six days a week for years. And here my daughter is, a senior, getting ready to graduate. I mean, they've traveled together. They faced opposition together. They've competed together. They've, and all along, they've learned from their coach. And now it's the end of the season and the end of the high school cross-country team, as they know it. And it's also the end for the coach he's retiring. And I remember the end of season team dinner, you know those team dinners, and there was so much you could tell that the coach wanted to say. There was so much that he just wanted to pass on. There's so many things he just wanted to tell them. And fortunately, he didn't share it all. We never would have gotten out of there that night. Um, but he knew the season of cross country was over. This, this time was over. Well, that's kind of how it's going to be tonight with Jesus. After three years with his disciples, and they walked together and fought together, and, and he's taught them, and there's been so much between them, he's now going to be leaving them. He knows that this season of ministry is coming to an end, but the story's just beginning. And so that's where we're going to pick it up. We're in chapter 13. We're going to start right off in the first few verses. Let me read verses 1 through 3. I want to encourage you to open your Bibles. Follow along with me um, as we read God's Word. And here what we're going to see is a picture of Jesus. It begins, It was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The evening meal was in progress, and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, and that he had come from God and was returning to God. We get this picture of Jesus, of Jesus in control. Here we get this picture of Jesus who knew exactly what he was doing. He knew what was happening. He had the power to change it if he wanted to. And he knew exactly what the plan was. He knew where he was from. He knew where he was going to. And he knew the situation at hand. What a comfort to know that Jesus not only has a grasp of the situation, but he has control of the situation. And here it is in this most difficult time, this most difficult moment, his greatest trial, and he's got full control. How much more so for us today, now? I mean, if there's ever a time I can think of in my entire life that we need the assurance that Jesus is in control, it would be now. 
with the pandemic, with the chaos of an election year, social justice, um, violence in the streets, and then forest fires. I don't know what's next, but I do know that Jesus is in control. He was then, he is now. And so just like last week, where we saw a lot of drama, we saw Mary and we saw um, the crowds and everything that was going on, we're gonna see drama this week too. And, and the drama I wanna paint for you is, as Jesus is beginning, at, we get into this chapter 13, this an urgency building. Chapter 12, he was starting to drop some heavy news. I'm going to be, I'm going to die. I'm going to be lifted up. You have a hard choice to make, light or dark. It, a crisis is brewing, and it's a crisis that Jesus knew was coming and, quite honestly, was making sure would happen. It's a crisis that it would even involve betrayal of one of the that's been following him and close to him for years. Yet, Jesus knows what he's doing. He did then, he does now. It also includes the fact that Jesus knew exactly what he wanted his disciples doing and what he wants us doing. And so let's read that. I'm going to read verses 4 and 5. So he, Jesus, got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. And after that, he poured water in a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel wrapped around his waist. This discourse, what we're about to see in these coming verses, is a picture of Jesus washing the feet of his disciples. Interestingly, only John captures this moment. Matter of fact, it's, it's striking what John chose to capture here. Maybe it's one of the reasons I just love John. Because where the other synoptic gospels saw the Last Supper and saw the important truth that Jesus shared with us, just breaking the bread and drinking from the cup and saying, Doing this, do this in remembrance of me. John sees a whole different situation. He sees a whole different moment. And he calls out some equally powerful truth for us. You see, John is the, the disciple that Jesus loved is going to tell us and show us Jesus' love. He's going he's to recount for us how Jesus just acts out that love and shows it to us and explains it to us. And perhaps who better than John to do that? In the last chapter, we saw Jesus, king and savior and um, miracle worker. Well, now we're seeing Jesus as humble servant. He's wrapping a towel around his waist. He's got a basin of water and he's going to wash his disciples' feet. You know, some imagery in the Bible is hard to make sense of, right? It's like, okay, well, what was that? Was that out of place? Was it un unexpected, unordinary? This one's pretty easy, right? Your, your rabbi, your teacher, your Lord, it's seemingly unfit for him to be down washing your feet. This is unexpected. And I also want to point out one other thing here. Jesus is washing their feet during the meal. It says he got up from the meal. The evening meal was in progress. Jesus gets up during the meal, stops everything, and washes their feet. Why? Well, normally you'd do it when they walked in the room, right? You'd have a servant even doing that as you came into the room. But no, Jesus stops the meal, gets up from the table, and washes their feet. I picture the table, the dinner, and everything that's going on, everyone just stops, and they're just watching Jesus as he goes around the table, washing feet. Jesus is teaching. He's making a point. And we see how unexpected and how uncomfortable this is through Peter's response. In these next verses, we see an interchange between Simon Peter and Jesus. Verse 6. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you do not realize what I'm doing now, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you'll never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Well, then, Lord, Simon Peter replied, not just my feet, but my head and my hands as well. Jesus answered, those 
who have had a bath need only wash their feet. Their whole body is clean, and you are clean. This exchange between Peter and Jesus, Peter is acknowledging that, that this is a menial task. It's a messy task. You're washing feet. It's seemingly unfit for Jesus. And Jesus says, though, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Jesus says, you have to embrace this, Peter, because this is essential. Unless I wash you, you have no part with me. You can't be like me. You can't play my role. You can't follow me. You can't be a little Christ. Let me wash your feet. This isn't salvation giving. This isn't that I can't be a follower of Jesus if he doesn't you know, physically wash my feet. But it is identity giving. Jesus is showing them what it means to follow him. Now, we look back at Jesus once again, fully in control, verses 11 and 12, actually part of verse 10. He says, and you are clean, although not every one of you, for he knew who was going to betray him. And that was why he said not everyone was clean. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes, returned to his place. I love this picture of Jesus finishing around the table. He's clearly in control. He says, I, not every one of you is clean. I know who's going to betray me. It's clear, Jesus, again, in control. But here's the drama. I mean, think about this. We, we have captured that he washed Simon Peter's feet. But he went around the table, which means he washed Judas's feet. He washed Judas's feet, knowing, knowing that this man who has followed him for years has been one of his closest followers with, this, with the 12, is going to betray him. And yet he washes his feet. And now Jesus explains what it is that he's just modeled for them. We return to verse 12, the second part. He says, do you understand what I've done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightfully so, for that is who I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I've set for you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master. No messenger is greater than the one who sends him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. Jesus explains that this is what I want you doing. He's explaining this is what I want you to do. Not, not fit literally washing feet, unless that's the need. But he says, I want you humbly serving. I want you caring for others. I want you serving others, meeting their needs. And Jesus is clear. If it's not too humbling for him, it's not too humbling for us. Not too humbling for those 12, and it's not too humbling for me. He says, you can do it. You should do it, and you'll be blessed by doing it. This, is, this moment is in my mind as visually concrete as that moment with Mary pouring the perfume on Jesus' feet. This moment of Jesus going around the table washing feet, I can just picture the basin and the water and the, and the towel, and Jesus is just caring for him. He's humbly serving them. And then he stops and teaches. This is what I want you doing. This is why I want you to follow me. This is what I want you to be doing. And John captures this. John sees this Jesus. We saw him as worthy of worship with Mary. Now we see him as humbly serving, coming to serve. That's the Jesus that John saw and knew. Now... Now the focus begins to change them. Now the focus shifts and we start to see that a countdown has begun. Because Jesus, as I said, knows what he's doing. I'm going to read verse 18 through 21. Jesus says, I'm not referring to all of you. I know those I have chosen. But this is to fulfill this passage of scripture. He who shared my bread turned against me. I'm telling you now before it happens so that when it does happen, you will believe that I am who I am. 
Very truly, I tell you, whoever accepts anyone I send accepts me, and whoever accepts me accepts the one who sent me. And after he said this, he was troubled in spirit and testified, Very truly, I tell you, one of you is going to betray me. Jesus knows what's unfolding. He's ensured that it's put in place. And it's now starting to unfold. He's preparing his disciples for what's going to be a very difficult goodbye. And he's starting to reveal to them what's going to happen. And I guess it's assuring them in a way that he is telling them, look, I know what's happening. And I'm telling you it now so that when it does happen, you'll look back and you'll say, aha, Jesus knew that was going to happen. He knew what was going on. Wait a minute, Jesus was in control the whole time. That's what he wants them to hold on to. But then it says, Jesus was troubled in spirit. And I picture Jesus, the one who came to seek and save the lost, the one who would leave the 99 to go after the one. And, and here he is at the table with Judas. Right over there is sitting Judas. And, and Judas is going to betray me. And I can only imagine how broken Jesus' heart was. When he says he was troubled in spirit, yes, he, the path before him is difficult, but I picture Jesus heartbreaking for Judas. Oh, if there was just any other way. I came in to seek and save the lost, and I'm going to lose you. I think we see so clearly here that love of Jesus. Now, right after this comes this really human interchange, quite honestly. It's this moment where now Jesus says, one of you is going to betray me. And I'm picturing they're at this meal, all right? And, and Jesus now lays it out. One of you is going to betray me. And I picture the room just goes, what? what one of us? What? One of us? And it even says in verse 22, his disciples stared at one another at a loss to know which one he meant. I'm, I, I, want, I want you to picture a classroom. And the teacher just drops in and says, hey, one of you cheated on the test. And I'm, everybody, all the students look at me, was it me? Was it you? Who did it? Who did it? And then we have Simon Peter. Of course, it's Simon Peter. And he speaks up. And he's like, he looks across the room to the disciple that Jesus loved, who's sitting next to him. And, and he motions to John and says, hey, ask him which one he means. So John leans back against Jesus and says, Lord, who is it? And Jesus says, it's the one to whom I hand this bread after dipping it in the dish. And then dipping the bread, he hands it to Judas. I love that little interchange, though. This, you're John and, and Peter, and, and they're all trying to figure out what's going on, right? I mean, it's clear. They're still trying to figure out what's going on. But in the middle of this, they're trying to grasp what's going on. And, and you just see the humanness of these guys that are trying to put it all together. And as I said last week, I say it again, I'm so encouraged that the disciples are who they are, that they are just like us. These were simple fishermen. They hadn't been trained. They hadn't been studying under rabbi. They were out catching fish. But Jesus brought them. He's been teaching them. And he's, he's been educating them. He's been informing them. And they're starting to get this picture. But just like us, they're trying to put it all together. But the wheels are in motion. And, and we see in, in verse 26, when Jesus says, it's the one to whom I give this piece of bread. When I've dipped it in the dish, he hands it to Judas. And as soon as Judas takes the bread, Satan enters into him. And Judas, then with the bread in hand, Jesus says, what you are about to do, do quickly. And once again, nobody understands. Everyone at the meal is like, what's he talking about? What's Judas going to do? I mean, it's easy for us to put two and two together, but their heads are spinning. As soon as Judas took the bread, he went out and it was night. The wheels are in motion. It, this moment it, it's as if Jesus just lit the fuse. It's as if just, Jesus just started the self-destruct sequence. It's as, as if just he just started the countdown for missile launch. He has just put in motion the acts that are going to fulfill his work. He started it. This, this was the start. Up to this point, it says 
that the Father had put all things under his power. And this is a moment where Jesus could have shirked. He could have delayed. He could have deferred, but he didn't. Instead, he carried through to do the Father's will. And, and, and Jesus, uh, Judas goes out into the night to betray him. And it's for that reason that we see in these next verses. We see 31 and 32. Jesus makes this proclamation for a while. I just, I couldn't grasp what, why is this in here? But Jesus says, when he had gone, Jesus says, now the son of man is glorified and God is glorified in him. And if God is glorified in him, God will glorify the son in himself and he will glorify him at once. It's just what a what a powerful, you know, impactful declaration he's making right in the middle of this moment. And what I realize is it's because he's lit the fuse. The wheels are in motion. Now, the room though, their heads are spinning. <laughs> and 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 so Jesus looks across the room. One of, them, one of us is going to betray him. Judas just left. Who was it? I, I think it was Judas. What's going on? I don't know. Everyone's, they're, they're at a loss. They're at a buzz. What did he say he's going to go do? Should we stop him? I don't, everyone is at a loss. Jesus looks at the room. And I see the compassion. I hear it in his voice as he says in verse 33, my children, I'll be with you just a little longer. What a tender way to approach his disciples. My children, I, he knows that they are as helpless as children. He knows that they are as unprepared for this moment as children. I'll be with you only a little longer. And then another truth that maybe they didn't expect. He says, you will look for me, but just as I told the Jews, so I tell you now, where I'm going, you cannot come. Boom. It was bad enough that one of them was going to betray him, but we can't go. We've been with you for three years. Every day we followed you. We've, we've, we've hung on every word and we can't go. Uh, can you imagine that? Place yourself in that room. Can you imagine the chaos, the, 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 the anguish, the, the mental gyrations? Everyone's head is just spinning as he says, you can't come. Matter of fact, a couple of verses later, we see Peter is so consumed in that. He, he responds to him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus replied, where I'm going, you cannot follow now, but you will follow later. Peter asked, Lord, why can't I follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. And Jesus answered, really? Will you really lay down your life for me? Very truly, I tell you before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. Jesus has just dropped yet another bombshell on them as he says, you can't come with me. Why can't they come? Jesus has all authority. The Father has put everything under his power. Why can't they come? Well, it's not the Father's plan. Jesus is, is doing the work of the Father. He's executing the Father's plan. It's not the Father's plan. But it's also that they can't leave. They got work to do. And that is the Father's plan. The murmur is going on in the room and everybody's trying to get their heads around this. And Jesus says, you can't come with me. And Peter says, why not? And Jesus reminds him, before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. He, what he's saying is, you can't do this, Peter. The work I'm about to do, only I can do. You cannot come. Only I alone can save you. I alone can die for your sins. I alone can accomplish the Father's work, his will. You can't come, but you will come later. There is hope. And then in the middle there, in the middle, there's this little passage. It's just two verses. It might be my favorite verses in the Bible. 
right after he said, my children will only be with you a little while longer. Where I'm going, you cannot come. Jesus looks at the room and looks at them just scattering and going, what, what are we doing? And their minds are spinning. And, the, and he looks at them and he says, a new command I give you. Love one another. As I have loved you, love one another. And by this, everyone will know that you're my disciples if you love one another. Sherry uh, Harney shared with us in a Wednesday night training uh, in the Good and Beautiful Life tr uh, class that you know, when the, something's mentioned three times, it's a, it's a picture of completeness. Holy, 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 truly, truly, truly. And his time he says, love one another, love one another, love one another. This is fundamental. This is foundational. And this is why you're not coming with me. I need you to love one another. You're going to need one another. Love one another. Love the Peters. Love the Judases. Love one another. And by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples. And this, this is why Shoreline is so, so focused on ministering to others. This is why we have our Good Neighbor Initiative, why we're, we're challenging one another to go out and to meet our neighbors, to engage with our neighbors, to connect with them. This is why we, are, uh, we have organic outreach, that we've been able to touch churches, believers around the world. That's why we have, in normal years, you know, things like back to school, things like serve our Central Coast. This is why we have a food bank that right now is two days a week serving this community. And while so many of you are faithfully showing up on Wednesdays to donate to the food bank. Because by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples. A new command I give you to love one another. Where are you loving one another? It's a question I'm asking myself. I was on a call recently and, 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 um, and I watched the staff members that are just, they're challenging one another, asking one another, how are you doing on being a good neighbor? How are you doing on your outreach temperature? And, and they're spurring one another on to, to be this, to live this out. How are you doing? I feel like a little bit like Peter tonight. We're going to close in prayer. But I feel a little bit like Peter because, you know, he says, I'm all in. But when the opportunity came, Jesus already knew he couldn't respond. He wouldn't respond. I want to respond. So can we just pray? I just want to ask God that he might show us how we might respond. Lord, thank you for John. Thank you that he sees you with crystal clear vision of who you are. Oh, I so thank you that he captured this moment where you washed the disciples' feet and you shared this command for us that's foundational. Love one another, love one another, love one another. And Lord, would you, would you even tonight, tomorrow, this week, would you show us a way that we can tangibly, concretely, in real life ways, love one another so that we can do that in your name and so that everyone would know that we are your disciples. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Thanks for viewing the teaching online. Please remember to join us for a time of discussion beginning at 7.30 p.m. led by one of our Shoreline leaders. To join, please visit our Wednesday night at Shoreline online page on our website and click join discussion next to the group with the first letter of your last name. We look forward to spending more time with you in deeper reflection and discussion. See you there.